I'm pleased indeed to welcome you to our first in a, perhaps in what may eventually become a series, but nonetheless the first workshop of this particular kind on the Iowa State University campus. About four years ago we started a series on estate planning. Since that time we've held a total of nine of those. This year it was suggested that we consider adding another topic to see if the interest might extend beyond the subject of estate planning. So we considered various opportunities that uh, we had to look at materials, various materials that we had prepared that might be of interest. We selected the one of civil liabilities. There are several reasons why we did that. One is, I think, and most importantly, there's much current concern in this area. It affects potentially almost everyone. Not everyone will perhaps be involved during the course of their lifetime in some aspect of liability of a civil nature, but nonetheless potentially it affects or could affect almost everyone. There's current concern because today there's much discussion of defending your property and how far you can go, defending your person and how far you can go. There's concern about encouraging people to come to the aid of others who are in a position of peril. There's also concern about the accountability of manufacturers, standpoint of negligence in design or negligence in manufacture. All of these are covered in our workshops on civil liabilities. We have a total of 12 units that we offer around the state uh, on various topics. We felt that this one might have the greatest application to uh, a group here on the Iowa State University campus. So we are pleased to see you, and for us this is sort of an experimental thing. We will solicit your comments. We would like to know what you think of this type of workshop. Uh, I observe several of you are back from last week when we concluded our ninth workshop on estate planning. As I indicated at that time, I hope that you came equipped with questions. We always hope that, but again, let me venture a guess that you'll go home with more questions than you came with, because our objective is a limited one in these workshops. Our objective, essentially, is to consider with you some possibilities for planning on your part, to consider possible avenues for action, to consider with you some of the types of concerns, some of the red flags, if you will, that you might want to uh, point up as you go through your day-to-day -day activities, as you consider your insurance program, your liability insurance program, and as you simply co conduct yourself from day to day and how you make decisions about your activities. As was the case last week and the week before, this particular workshop is sponsored by University Extension. Uh, the small fee that you pay goes for cookies and coffee. We will have a coffee break about midway through. Uh, the uh, workshop will be concluding at about 9.30. We will try to leave plenty of time near the end for questions and we'll be pausing from time to time to take your questions as we go along. Please feel free at any point if we tend to use language or suggest uh, a term that may seem strange to you, please feel perfectly free to raise your hand and ask us to further identify what we're talking about, to further explain, to further uh, define those topics or to perhaps make an extension that would be of interest to you. We may not cover all the topics that you had in mind. If not, and I've already been approached by one participant who would like an additional topic, please bring those up near the end of the hour. I think we'll have time to touch upon those additional items. State law is quite important in this area. In the liability area, state law is just as important as in the estate planning area, inasmuch as most of the law that deals with liabilities is oriented to a particular state. So what you uh, hear discussed this evening will be primarily applicable to Iowa. If you move to Illinois or some other state, the law may be somewhat different. Although there is considerable uniformity as among the states, especially those states that derive their historical traditions from the common law world. That's all except the, the states in the far west and the southwest. They tend to view life a little bit differently along with the state of Louisiana, which derives its influence from the Code Napoleon. But uh, do keep in mind that each state approaches the subject of liabilities a bit differently. What we're really talking about in the civil liabilities area is who bears the risk, who pays the cost, who suffers when costs are encountered or incurred, 
Who will suffer if someone is injured or someone's property is damaged or destroyed? The law sets up a broad, general kind of a framework within which broad, general decisions are made as to who pays, who bears the burden, who suffers the cost. It's a fairly general kind of a burden, a, uh, pardon me, a fairly general kind of a framework. You may feel, as we go through our discussion this evening, that the legal framework is very gross, quite crude. And I think I would agree with you in uh, certain uh, points because this is an old framework. It's a framework that dates back four or five hundred years, and it is continually being revised by statute to take off some of the rough edges, to make it a more finite kind of a framework um, rather than the broad general kind of a, of a system for determining who bears the cost. We are concerned primarily about torts. Now, some of you may say, aha, that's something we eat. Well, it's really not. It's something we worry about. A tort is the kind of an act that may produce liability, may produce a response in damages. It is a great body of law. In fact, it's a very substantial body of law. Tort law encompasses, for example, negligence. It encompasses more, actually, however, than negligence. It includes such things as libel. It includes slander. It includes uh, almost all kinds of wrongs that we'd classify as civil wrongs. Now, we should be careful to, to define a civil wrong in contrast to a criminal act. A civil wrong is a wrong that involves two people or two or more people. It's primarily a dispute between you and I. If the state is involved as a party, then it becomes a criminal matter. A criminal act involves an act against the state. The same specific act can be both a criminal matter and a civil matter. Tonight we are limiting ourselves to simply the civil aspects, but many of the acts we'll be talking about are also criminal, involving the state as an interested party. The state is involved in tort law only insofar as the state provides a forum for the civilized resolution of conflicts through courts and also through providing a body of law for the systematic resolution of those conflicts. We are not talking about contracts. Now that's a civil matter, to be sure, and it involves private individuals. But we are not going to be talking tonight about contract-type wrongs. That would be an interesting topic, but it is beyond what we could possibly do in the limited time we have available. Well, in the outline, you'll notice we're starting off with a look at intended kinds of torts. Now this is the worst kind. These are the most colossal of the no-nos, the ones that people intend to commit. And the law takes a very dim view of the kinds of invasions that we would, we would characterize as the intended invasions of people's security. Now there are three of these we're going to be considering this evening. We're going to start out by looking at the intended invasion, which we refer to as assault. The assault intended invasion you'll recognize possibly as being also a crime. I'm certain you've noticed in the newspaper from time to time that a person might have been arrested for assault and battery. Don't confuse that criminal act with the civil matter of assault. Now what is an assault? Well an assault is the act of placing someone in fear or apprehension of their continued good health. Thus if I were to pull back my fist and I were to bring it up to within just a half inch of someone's jaw, not connecting with it, just simply bringing it up to the point where the person becomes very fearful, apprehensive, unsure of what's going to happen next, that could very well be an assault. The act of placing someone in fear or apprehension doesn't require an offensive touching, just the act of placing someone in fear. You notice in our society, there's a great deal of dignity attached to the human individual. The fact that you are not under an obligation to endure all sorts of indignities. And if you are placed in a position of enduring indignities, then you have a cause of action. You have a complaint that can be resolved in court. One of these is assault, merely a matter of placing someone in fear or apprehension. What are the damages that could be recovered? Well, you are not limited to actual damages. Obviously, actual damages would be very difficult to prove. What is a measure of the trauma 
that you might suffer if someone were to assault you by simply being very threatening in their gestures against your person. It's very difficult to specify actual damages. So generally speaking, it's whatever the judge will allow or the jury will, will permit. There is no specific limit to the kinds of damages that might be permitted in an assault. Now a battery is a second kind of intended invasion of personal security. A battery is sometimes referred to as a completed assault. However, it need not be necessarily, inasmuch as it's possible to have a battery without it being preceded by an assault. Now, if I were to complete the swing of my fist and actually establish contact with the jaw, that becomes a battery. It's an offensive touching of another that's neither consented to nor privileged. The offensive touching of another that's neither consented to nor privileged. Again, you are not under a duty to be pummeled, to be, to be hit, to be elbowed, to be kicked. This is part of the protection that inures to the private individual in our society. Again, it's part of the dignity of the individual. And so if you are placed in that position of undergoing an offensive touching, then you may have a cause of action. Again, damages are not limited to actual damages. It's whatever the judge will allow or the jury will return. It's a very, very uh, serious matter to be assaulted or to be battered, if you will. Now, what are some examples of batteries in, a, in our fairly everyday type of contact? Obviously, the, 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 the slap or the, the, uh, the fist colliding with the jaw would be one. The involuntary haircutting party can be another kind of an offensive touching. And in these days of, of, of longer hair than some would, would actually want for themselves, occasionally you hear it said, well, we'll just get that guy and we'll take off his hair. Well, that is an offensive touching of another. Could be a battery. The typical kind or the kind of activity that used to exist in Greek residences using the well-known traditional paddle, that too obviously is a kind of a battery. The involuntary shower party, which sometimes takes place in residence halls or in the military service, when someone is not actually keeping his state of personal hygiene quite as high as those about him would like, then if they take him to the shower and inflict a shower on him or her, then that becomes a battery also. There are cases in which the removal of an organ that was unauthorized by a surgeon is a battery, the unauthorized removal of an organ. There are many of these types of cases. Now, you might say, well, now, what about an athletic contest? Surely that is one battery after another, particularly football, and it is. But that's an example of a consented to kind of a battery. Obviously, a football game is a battery, one series of batteries. However, the person who engages in an athletic contest, whether it's football or basketball or whatever, consents to a certain measure of the contact that we would otherwise call a battery. Now, there are even limits to that. As we have observed in recent weeks from certain athletic contests that have resulted in disciplinary action against certain basketball players, there are lim limits even to the kinds of of activity, the kinds of contact that a player consents to there. But they consent to the normal kind of, of contact that one would anticipate from a sport of that nature. Okay, that is the battery. Now the third one of the intended invasions that's quite commonly known is what is called false imprisonment. Now false imprisonment is the act of confining another within a boundary, within a fixed boundary, no matter how short the duration of the confinement might be, provided, once again, that was neither consented to nor privileged. Once again, we might emphasize, in our society there's a great deal of dignity that the individual is not to be confined within a fixed boundary. You're not privileged to lock someone else up just because you don't like what they did or you're wanting to play a trick on them, a prank. This is not part of the rights that you have you can find someone else. And if you do that, then you may be guilty of false imprisonment, whatever the judge will allow or the jury will return in the case of damages. There used to be a substantial question in this area with respect to the merchant 
who accosted a suspected shoplifter. However, a few years ago, the Iowa General Assembly removed a great deal of the concern there by providing considerable protection to the merchant who accosts someone who is suspected of shoplifting and interrogates them. But if someone comes to your home and you get into a wild argument, you become so upset, you throw them in the closet, lock the door, and go off to have a cup of coffee, obviously that is a false imprisonment. If you work in a bank and one day you think it would be just great sport to, f to slip out a little early out of the bank vault, slam the door, twirl the, twirl the lock, and go off for lunch, and then you'll come back an hour later and let them out. Well, this kind of a seemingly innocent prank could be the subject of a false imprisonment action. As we'll note a little bit later, also you may encounter a false imprisonment problem if you try to make an arrest of someone. There is a well-developed concept of the citizen's arrest, where one citizen has a certain limited right to make an arrest of someone else. If you do that, and if it turns out you didn't have enough protection to make the citizen's arrest, then the fact that you've confined someone may actually open up to a charge of false imprisonment. Is there a question? That could possibly be if, as a matter of fact, he is confined within a fixed boundary, the group has the, the seeming power to confine him. And it's viewed from the standpoint of, of his outlook on life, so long as it's a fairly reasonable outlook on life, and it could very well be that they have effected an imprisonment just about as completely as if he were within four walls. See, It's a question of fact in a case like that. Uh, I mentioned earlier, going back to review just briefly the assault and battery uh, dichotomy, I mentioned that a battery need not necessarily follow an assault. If you're walking down the streets of Ames on a Saturday night and someone comes up behind you, puts their arm around in front of your face over the eyes, hand over the eyes, and say, guess who? That's an offensive touching. That's a battery. It was not preceded by an assault at all. So it's quite possible to have a battery that starts out being a battery in the first instance without being preceded by an assault. Oftentimes, however, uh, a, an assault will precede a battery. Any other questions? Yes? What about in the teacher-student relationship? All right. I was going, just going to mention that. Obviously, you'll note that adults are entitled to a full measure of protection from assault and battery and false imprisonment. However, not all citizens have a full measure of protection. Children do not. In the first instance, children are subjected to their parents. Parents can assault and batter and imprison their children, at least within rather extreme limits. The parents cannot, of course, abuse the children. And there are, of course, remedies if parents are abusing the parental right of control of the children. But the parents can inflict corporal punishment. Obviously, they couldn't on another adult, but they can on their children. And they can confine them in their room for various miscreant kinds of deeds. As the child leaves home to go to school, the law has placed a measure of that same right over children in the hands of the school. The concept is known generally as the concept of in loco parentis. The school stands somewhat in the role of the parent. And so the school becomes entitled to handle disciplinary problems without as much concern about assault and battery and false imprisonment as would be the case if they were dealing with an adult. Obviously, you can't keep an adult in after school, or you can't ask the adult to bend over and apply what would be mild corporate, corporal punishment. But you, this can be done in a school system unless it becomes willful or wanton unless it moves beyond the point of the normal kind of punishment. So minors don't really have a full measure of these rights until they've reached adulthood. And it's not a, an easy uh, zone, or it's not an easy line of demarcation between the status of a child and the status of an adult. 
And this is part of the great concern in recent years as children move through the elementary grades, the junior high grades, high school and college as to when the concept of in loco parentis has been completely eliminated and when it has just been simply uh, reduced in terms of the rights that accompany it. Well, it will be more defined at least at that point. However, there's some feeling that not all of these rights may continue even to that point. But certainly, there would be no justification, uh, really, uh, at least for most purposes, uh, after age 18 in continuing to exercise this kind of a doctrine because they are fully entitled to exercise the legal rights of an adult at that point. Correct. As you know, the theories of, of control have gone through a metamorphosis through the contract theory, the due process theory, uh, particularly on university campuses, as the doctrine of in loco parentis has, has not been as important a concept as, as uh, completely followed as it was several years ago. Okay, is there anything else on the intended invasion side? All right, let's now consider some of the privileged invasions. There are situations in which you're privileged to inflict torts on others. And even though what would otherwise be an assault or a battery or false imprisonment is clearly committed, nonetheless, you may not be responsible. It may not create liability. Now, as we consider these privileged invasions, we might start with a look at the concept of self-defense. Under what circumstances can you defend yourself, members of your family, and how far can you go in defending yourself or members of your family? Obviously, any attempt at self-defense may very well involve a battery or an assault on your attacker. So we have possibly a conflicting set of, of rules or principles. The general rule on self-defense is that if you're attacked outside your home, and it's a different rule if you're attacked inside your home, but looking first at the attack outside the home, the general rule has been that you can use reasonable force to repel your attacker up to the infliction of great bodily injury or the taking of a life. Before you're privileged to inflict great bodily injury or take a life, if attacked away from your home, you've been under a general duty to retreat to the wall, to try to extricate yourself from the fray and get away from the controversy. There's a duty to do that. If it appears unreasonable, to try to extricate yourself from the fray, if it appears that it would be uh, a useless or futile act, then you're privileged to continue to resist, to defend yourself, members of your family, even to the point, if necessary, of inflicting great bodily injury or taking a life. But attacked away from your home, you're under a duty to try to get away. So if someone comes up as you walk down the street some evening, and they elbow you or jostle you in an offensive way, then you are not privileged to pull out your 45 and shoot them dead. That is not the privilege. You're supposed to try to get away. Now, if it appears that that person is heavily armed, he's larger than you are, has a very ominous uh, uh, facade about him, then you are privileged to size up that entire environmental picture and make a decision as to whether it would be futile to retreat to the wall. But there is that duty to try to retreat to the wall. Now, if you're attacked in your home, there is no duty to retreat to the wall. There you're privileged to stand your ground, apply whatever force is reasonably necessary, escalate it if necessary, and even to the point of taking a life or infliction of great bodily injury if it appears reasonably necessary to accomplish the result of self-defense. But remember that only in the home, it's only in the home that you're not under duty to try to get away before you, you make that supreme move to inflict great bodily injury or take a life. In a home, because of, as the old saying has gone, a man's home is his castle, and you're not under a duty to, to abandon your home you may remain there and use whatever force is reasonably necessary. This is defending yourself. Now let's move to a discussion of defending one's property. This, of course, much in the news recently, uh, partly because of the rather well-known Iowa case of recent time, 
case of Catco versus Briney, also because of legislative attempts in Nebraska to change the rule substantially, which attempts were held unconstitutional. Well, let's state the general rule of self-defense with respect to your property, and then let us consider the case of Catco Briney and also the Nebraska attempts. Now, in defending one's property, there is a general privilege to uh, take whatever steps seem to be necessary to protect your property if it appears to be in danger of being damaged or being taken, being misused, being appropriated. You're privileged to take whatever steps would appear to be reasonably necessary to protect your property, but not to the point of inflicting great bodily injury or taking a life. This you're not privileged to do. And there has never been a privilege to inflict great bodily injury or take a life. This is an old and ancient rule, way back to ancient England. This is a classic collision of the rights with respect to property and the rights that people have with respect to themselves, the personal rights. And so the rule has been rather clearly stated for many, many years that in the defense of your property, you're privileged to uh, inflict as, as much injury or as much damage onto the individual or individuals who are about to take the property as appears necessary, but you cannot escalate it to the point where you are inflicting great bodily injury or taking a life. Now, yes, question. Well, this is again, as is nearly always the case in tort law, because most of this is case law, and cases come up one by one, and a court will make a decision based upon the facts before it at that time. So you hardly ever have a nice, clear-cut rule that says you can shoot off below the ankle, but not up to the knee. You see, that's not quite that neat. Actually, there are some indications that the permanence of injury has something to do with it. If it looks like the injury or appears that the injury is something that is going to cause permanent problems to the individual, then that has, has probably passed into the realm of great bodily injury. Of course, death is rather clearly defined. We don't need to say too much about that. Now, many of these cases involve uh, the trespass by an individual on the property of another, and in some cases have involved the rigging of spring guns or the building of traps, uh, something of that nature. And this, of course, was the case of Catco versus Briney, where uh, an individual was trespassing. Uh, in fact, the individual later paid a fine for the criminal act involved. In an effort to control the trespassing, the farmer who owned the house uh, on and property on which the trespass had been taking place rigged up a, a gun to a uh, and attached a wire from the trigger to the doorknob, climbed out the window and went home. And so when the trespasser opened up the door to this particular room, greeted with uh, material coming from the gun. And this, traditionally, has not been the type of activity that one can engage in to protect his property. The, you're to stop short of this. Stop short of it. The idea being that you cannot set yourself up as a self-appointed judge and executioner. The courts are there to decide whether, in fact, an act has been committed and that would justify either a civil penalty or a criminal penalty, and also the circumstances under which that sanction can be imposed. Otherwise, would place in the hands of the private property owner the, the right to size up, make the decision as to whether guilt was present, and to levy the penalty on the spot. And this, the common law system has generally not done. The state of, uh, the state of Nebraska, a few years ago, um, passed a law which abrogated this particular rule, uh, permitting a person in defense of his property to go beyond the old common law rule. The Nebraska statute was held unconstitutional by the Douglas County District Court in Omaha and later was held unconstitutional by the Nebraska Supreme Court. But it continues to be a much discussed topic as to how far a person should be able to go 
in the defense of his property. Any questions you'd like to raise about this? Yes. I'm not certain. I'm hearing. Yes. Stockings over the face. No, you can use reasonable means to protect your property. Well, bigger than you are. So the better part of valor may not be to, to uh, stand in front of them and say, uh, you can't do this. There's the practical problem of what you can do. You can, if they have committed an act that would justify an arrest, you can possibly make a citizen's arrest. At this point, Well, uh, the practical options may be quite limited. You can call the sheriff, but the pr people may be gone by the time the sheriff comes. You can, you can use whatever uh, equalizing means you might take to which we expect to arrest. Now, uh, the cases here range all the way from those who uh, use uh, a club or something he stationed himself strategically with his shotgun uh, in the sh in the shadow of a tree one night comes now a, a carload of individuals stopped stealthily moved across the ditch into the patch he said halt before I shoot or I'll shoot they didn't halt he shot once in the air and once at them one of them was killed and he was convicted of manslaughter. So you must remember that whatever means you select to use to defend your property could very well escalate into an unlawful act on your part. Well, that could be a little different situation, particularly if he felt that his own personal good health was at stake. Then it becomes a matter of defending himself. And you see, in defending yourself, it's quite a different situation than defending your property. With yourself, you can go so far under proper circumstances to take a life or inflict great bodily injury. But if the only reasonable threat appears to be to your property, you're not privileged to do that. You see the, you see the line there? Yes. Well, uh, it depends on the reasonableness, but since he was the miscreant in the first instance, then the courts tend to look a little askance if he immediately converts this from a trespass into a self-defense on his part. Although there are several cases in which a person started out committing a very uh, nominal type of a criminal act or maybe just a civil trespass. And the violent and wild response by the property occupier or owner was so great that he felt he had to fight back just to defend his, to de defend his state of health. And in some cases, he ended up killing the property owner. And there have been some instances in which he was not held responsible because of the totally unexpected, unanticipated, violent reaction on the part of the property owner. So you could conceivably have that occurring. A court or a jury would take a realistic look at the facts as they led up to it to see whether it was reasonable for the initial trespasser to be converted into the defender of himself to the point where he'd be justified in inflicting great bodily injury or taking a life. That's correct. Um, I suppose my response to that would be, what are our alternatives? What are our alternatives? To empower the person in defense of his property to, to inflict great bodily injury or to take a life. 
That is one alternative. That's an alternative that, that some would favor. It's generally been one that the courts have rejected, however, because of the, of the extreme consequence involved. One of the notions I think running through this is that if it involves property, there may very well be a second opportunity to fine, to locate, and to levy a penalty. If you permit death or severe injury, there is no second opportunity to take a look at the, at the facts, the circumstances of the event. And yes, I think that a court generally would take this into account. And only if you were quite unrealistic and unreasonable in your response, particularly where you're attacking your home, are you in serious difficulty as far as liability is concerned. Since we've talked a little bit about the defense uh, of one's property in terms of a possible arrest, let's consider the question of under what circumstances you are privileged to make a citizen's arrest. And we'll contrast that with the circumstances under which a peace officer can make, a, a, can make an arrest of private individuals. The first opportunity for a private person to make a citizen's arrest is where a public offense has been committed or attempted in that person's presence. Now, each of those words has a great deal of meaning and significance. It must be a public offense, not that you think a public offense has been committed, but a public offense has been committed or has been attempted, and it must be in your presence. Now, a public offense includes any crime. Crimes are divided into two basic classes. All of them go to make up a public offense category. There's the misdemeanor, the less serious kind of a crime and felonies, the more serious kind of a crime. The dividing line between misdemeanor and felony is that a felony is punishable by imprisonment in a state penitentiary or reformatory. The really quite serious types of crimes. But either misdemeanor or felony could be the subject of a private citizen's arrest if it has been committed and if it was committed or attempted in your presence. If you think a public offense was committed and it later turns out it wasn't a public offense, then you may be in difficulty. Or if it turns out that it really wasn't in your presence, you're cruising down the highway or walking down the sidewalk and you observe an act. Let's just take the sidewalk incident. You're walking down the sidewalk, you hear tinkling glass behind you. There is a jewelry store back there. So you turn around and you see someone running. Well, was that committed or attempted in your presence? Even if there was a criminal act attempted or committed? Was it in your presence? If you observe one person in the act of knifing another or clubbing another one unmercifully and you effect a citizen's arrest, it might turn out that was self-defense. And then there is no public offense, perhaps. And that removes the protection you have. So the general rule is that a citizen's arrest should be something you would undertake very, very sparingly and in rather clear-cut situations. The second opportunity for a citizen's arrest is where a felony has been committed. That limits it to the more serious type of crime. Where a felony has been committed, that is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary reformatory, and the person about to commit there to make the arrest has reasonable ground for believing that the person to be arrested has committed it. This is the first entry of reasonableness. Here you can be reasonable have no more than a reasonable ground for belief that the person has committed the felony. But there must have been a felony. There is no defense if you just were reasonable in thinking a felony had been committed. So the felony must have been committed. If so, you may make a citizen's arrest properly if you have reasonable ground for believing that the person or persons to be arrested have in fact committed it. Let's compare this with the rest by peace officers.
peace officers can make an arrest in obedience to a warrant, obviously, which is, of course, a rather common kind of an arrest circumstance. In addition, without an a warrant, a peace officer can make an arrest, again, almost identical to the private citizen, for a public offense committed or attempted in his presence. But then we go on. Where a public offense has been committed, and he has reasonable ground for believing the person to be arrested has committed it. Here is the injection of reasonableness as to the identity of the person for a public offense. A private citizen didn't have that measure of protection until it had become a felony. And it's asking a bit much of a private citizen as he's standing there wondering whether to really make a citizen's arrest, uh, letting all the crimes roll through his mind as to whether this particular one is likely a felony or a misdemeanor. That's placing a great burden on the individual. The third one is where the arresting individual, where the arresting officer, peace officer, has reasonable ground for believing that an indictable public offense, now that's a more serious kind of a public offense, it includes the indictable misdemeanor and felony, has been committed. Here the reasonableness concept modifies the commission of the, of the act, and also the usual reasonableness as to the identity of the perpetrator. So you can see there the additional protection that a peace officer has that a private citizen does not. Yet the citizen's arrest is still uh, rather common. In fact, within the last two weeks, one rather well-known example of the citizen's arrest. Did any of you notice this in the press, or television, within the last two or three weeks? A group in Tulsa attempted to effect a citizen's arrest of the cast of the rock musical Hair. And uh, it did not succeed, but there was an attempt made to effect a citizen's arrest of that group within the last, well, within the last month at least. There's a fourth situation for arrest by peace officers for the lengthy statement that if it has been announced that a, uh, a warrant has been issued, is being held for the ar arrest of the person, then the peace officer, of course, is permitted. Those are the instances in which a peace officer is permitted to make an arrest considerably greater latitude than is in the case with a, uh, with a private individual. Well, at this point, we might cover one more item, that of reclaiming your property, before we take a look at the problems of trespassers and others who come on to your property. The idea of being able to reclaim your property rests essentially on the principle that if your property ends up on someone else's property, through no fault of your own, through wind or water movement or something of that nature. The wind wafts your, uh, your Monday morning wash over onto your neighbor's property, and it has nothing to do with your negligence. You acted reasonably, but your property somehow ended up over on your neighbor. You're privileged to reclaim your property, even though it's a violation of his property rights, but you must pay for it. You must pay for damages you cause. This is quite common in rural areas where floods come along and float three pen hog houses down the stream or blow sunshades away in the high wind. You're privileged to go after such property where your own negligence was not really an element. But if damage is caused, then you must, of course, compensate for that. Question. A pheasant and any other game bird or game animal is property of the state. Any game is state property until it is reduced to possession. Now, when you shoot it, you haven't yet reduced it to possession. And until you do, then you can't assert that as your property. Therefore, if a bird happens to fly over and land or fall on someone else's property, then you have a problem of the right to go across that property to obtain the animal, the bird, whatever it is. It's an important point to keep in mind that all public or all kinds of wild game, birds, whatever, are not really your property until such time as you've reduced its possession. There's a very, very famous case in which there was a dispute over who really was entitled to the fox, product of a fox hunt. One party was going pell-mell in one direction, chasing the fox. 
Another party was going pell-mell at 90 degrees, and they ended up catching the same fox. And there was a great dispute over who was entitled to the fox. One had shot the fox, the other actually reduced it to physical possession. And the court indicated that it's the one reducing the animal to physical possession that's entitled to the fox. The mere shooting of it, wounding of it, or the pursuit of it doesn't give you property rights in the fox or the bird or whatever it happens to be. Okay? Well, if there are a question here. These, yeah, these are really two separate questions. In retrieving it, you're clearly under a duty to pay for any damage of retrieval. Now, as to whether you are under a duty to compensate for damages caused by the untoward movement of the property downstream is a different problem, and that depends upon uh, negligence, basically, or whether you had acted improperly in the siting or locating or securing of your property in light of the circumstances. That's a question of who is negligence, whether you'd continue to be responsible for it. Okay. Well, I think at this point it might be worthwhile if we were to move a little bit out of order. And for those of you who are following, if you move to Roman numeral 10 on page 5, we'll look at the duties owed to persons coming onto land. It fits in probably better at this point than anywhere else. It's an easy transition from defending your property into a look at the duties that you owe people coming onto your land. There's a very well-defined hierarchy of statuses here, starting with the trespasser at the bottom of the heap and ranging up through the invitee at the other end of the scale. The lowest, the smallest amount of duty owed is that owed to trespassers. Stating another way, the amount of care that you owe to a trespasser is relatively small. But contrast that with the person who's on your premises for business advantage, there you owe a very great duty of care. Let us consider now the trespasser, and we're carving out the child trespasser for special treatment. The child trespasser is a special case, and later on we'll try to define for you what we mean by child in this setting. An adult trespasser who comes onto property largely will take the premises as they are. And if the trespasser is injured, in general, he cannot be heard to complain or she cannot be heard to complain. But you are under a duty to abstain from willfully or wantonly harming a trespasser. Not setting a spring gun or a trap, you cannot anticipate a trespasser with some kind of a dangerous instrumentality. And that relates back to the defense of one's property idea we had covered earlier. But beyond that, injuries suffered by a trespasser are normally not the worry of the landowner or the land occupier. However, once you observe the trespasser on the property, that elevates the trespasser a small notch on the scale. An observed trespasser who isn't removed from the premises who's permitted to stay on the premises, becomes what is called a bare licensee. Meaning that in addition to abstaining from willfully or wantonly harming him or her, you must also be careful to tell that individual or individuals of dangers you know about that they don't. So if you find someone trespassing on your property and you approach them and say, well, now, I would just prefer you not be here, but since you're here, I won't insist you leave right now. Then you should also follow that up with a statement, but remember, I have a very antisocial bull just over the hill, and I would advise you that he tends to be a very dangerous instrumentality. And if you fail to do that and permit them to remain, then you may have violated your duty of care. That is the bare licensee, yeah. Well, in general, in a ripping of the pants type of a situation, that's probably his own negligence, where he's no more than a bare licensee. 
be rather difficult for a bear licensee or a trespasser to complain about that. Now, we're going to move up the scale to a point where it might be your concern, at least for invitees, but probably not for the licensee or the trespasser. What about the child trespasser? That is a special case, as we said. This is an interesting doctrine, sometimes called the attractive nuisance doctrine. Occasionally you hear it referred to as the turntable doctrine. It really arose and got its great formative beginnings early in the years of railroading. When railroads were being developed through the country, they needed some type of a mechanism for turning the train around. And so at the terminal points on railroads, they would erect massive steel structures, turntables, They'd run the engine and a car or two out on the turntable. Then the crew would pull the pins and very slowly turn it around and head it back in the other direction. Well, when the railroad crew, the train crew, wasn't using the turntable, the children in the neighborhood loved to go out and sit on the turntable. Well, for a while they'd be consent just to sit there and imagine that it was turning. But as children generally are, they like to have more action than that. And so they would figure out how to pull the pins themselves. So they would pull the pins, or cases where the pins were locked, they would wait until someone was careless and didn't lock the pins. Then they would all get behind the, the edge of it, and they'd push, get it going very, very slowly, but nonetheless moving with enormous torque, really, their massive weight. Then they would hop on, and the children would ride around the turntable, not going very rapidly, but nonetheless going. All would go well until the turntable had rotated approaching 180 degrees, and the rails were beginning to match up again. Then as the rails matched up, the children would lose their legs and their hands, their arms. Grievous injury would occur to the children because of this grinding of metal on metal. And so the courts, in a rare fit of judicial imagination, developed the turntable doctrine, the doctrine of attractive nuisance, out of whole cloth, that if you maintain an instrumentality on your property, which tends to attract children, and if it in fact does attract children and they are injured, and you could have used reasonable care and probably kept them off or reduced the risk substantially, you're under a duty to do so. And if you fail, then you may be responsible even though the children are trespassing. I'll give you a few examples. It might help to cement this concept more firmly in your mind. There was a case not very long ago involving three young boys who were on their way swimming one hot and muggy July afternoon in Pennsylvania. They had about four miles to go to the local swimming pool, so they were nonchalantly making their way down through town. They made their way across, partway across an industrial area, and as they were going, they were remarking about how hot it was and went a long way to the swimming pool. They noticed about 100 yards over off the beaten path a beautiful crystalline pool. So being uh, maximizers of their own satisfaction, they decided, well, we'll just go no further. We'll stop here and swim. So they stripped the all together and dove in, but it wasn't water. It was a not-so-dilute solution of H2SO4. And those of you who remember your basic chemistry know that sulfuric acid has a rather deleterious effect upon human flesh and skin. Two of them died on the spot, the third one died a few days later. It was a case of attractive nuisance. The company had permitted to develop there an instrumentality that was misleading, that attracted children, and they were damaged to their detriment. A duty not to permit that kind of an instrumentality to develop. Another example, not too many years ago, involved an abandoned automobile. Now, children love to play on abandoned automobiles. They'll play around, they'll try to get them started, and in this particular case they couldn't figure out why the engine wouldn't start, so one of them went into the house and got a box of matches, came back, struck one match to see if there was any gas in the gas tank. They couldn't see down into the gas tank. So they struck the match, opened it up, and looked, and of course there was just enough fumes to blow the thing up, and they were three or four of them were killed in the process, the rest of them were injured case of attractive nuisance. This is a particularly important concept where your activities are carried on near where, lar where children congregate, where children are there by virtue of school or playground, something of that nature. If you are carrying on activities near where children congregate, then there's a duty to use care to see that children are either kept off the premises or that your dangerous instrumentalities are rendered relatively safe for the children. Now, at what age do children really command this kind of respect and this kind of care? Well, clearly the cases point up to about age seven, there's not much doubt. 
between age 7 and about age 14, it depends on the circumstances, beyond about age 14 or 15, then children tend to begin to be treated as adults with respect to understanding the magnitude of harm that comes from these kinds of dangerous instrumentalities. The Iowa Supreme Court in recent years has had occasion to uh, answer the question whether the attractive nuisance doctrine applies to farm ponds. And the answer has been it does not. It does not. The Supreme Court has said this would be too much of a burden on landowners if it were to apply to farm ponds. I would be a little reluctant, however, to extrapolate that rule to, say, swimming pools in a city or town. I think we may be in the approaching the time when the attractive nuisance doctrine might be held to apply uh, to the maintenance of a swimming pool in a densely populated area. Because it is misleading and children can be damaged, can, can drown uh, before they really understand the nature and the magnitude of the swimming pool as a risk. Okay, any questions with respect to this? Yes. Well, that particular question relates also to whether it, in fact, is lawful to place a fence across a stream. And this depends upon the nature of the stream. If it's a navigable stream, then the bed is owned by the state of Iowa because the bed of navigable streams became state property when Iowa became a state in 1846. If it is a meandered stream, meandered by the old federal surveys, then the bed of the stream is held in public trust. And again, it would be a violation to fence across the public land. If, however, the stream is a non-meandered, non-navigable stream, then the bed may very well be owned by the adjacent landowners, you see. So the first step here must be to determine the legality of any kind of a fence. Once you've determined the legality of a fence, then you begin to examine the actual a choice of fence as to whether this is a proper choice of fence. Iowa has a great deal of fence law as to what kind of fence law is permitted. Most of it has to do with partition fences, and these would often be a partition fence. Iowa law spells out in gruesome detail what constitutes an acceptable partition fence. They can either be a lawful fence or a tight fence, but in neither case, even though they define in great detail what it can be, in neither case is, it, is the electric fence mentioned. Part of the reason is that the Iowa Fence Law was passed, I believe, about 1857, before electric fences really were of great consequence. And in each instance, there is the statement that if the township fence viewers uh, will agree that about any kind of fence can be equivalent to a lawful or tight fence. So I suppose this question might resolve itself down to the point, if it's a partition fence, as to whether the township fence viewers, and those of you who aren't who don't meet up with the fence viewers every day might want to know that those are the township trustees uh, as to whether they would approve the electric fence as a lawful or a tight fence as the case may be. Okay? Question here? No, the rules of navigability are quite involved and quite detailed. Uh, the, uh, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember exactly seems to me floating a craft six months or more out of the year. I wouldn't want to be certain until I went back and read some of those, some of those cases, but uh, the rules are quite specific on navigability. But remember that both in the navigable and in the meandered state, the public owns the, the bed of the stream. It's only in the non-navigable, non-meandered where the bed is not owned by the public. Yes. 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 Well, <laughs> that's a difficult question because sometimes these construction sites are near schools, and children may play there on the way to or from or on weekends. Uh, the basic question is, are you creating a dangerous instrumentality? See, now in most instances, I think home builders carry considerable liability insurance. Uh, realizing this, this can be a problem. Obviously, you can't be there 
24 hours a day to keep the children off. And if you post a sign saying no trespassing, children aren't going to read that anyway. And the no trespassing sign really does little more than reinforce the situation anyway because uh, they are trespassing whether the sign's up or not, if it's not their property. So. Okay, that's the trespasser situation. One more question here. Parked on your property or on the roadway? Of hidden dangers that you know about that they don't, that could be relevant to them. If they're in a car, maybe those dangers aren't very substantial. It's a question of fact. They may not appreciate being disturbed uh, anyway. <laughs> Their ideas of hazards may not be your ideas of hazards. <laughs> yes. If you observe them as trespassers. Now, the mere fact their car is there is sort of circumstantial. If you don't know they're on your property, they might be off someplace else. But if you observe them as trespassers on your property, there's a duty either to remove them or to tell them of dangers you know about they don't. The old open well, or uh, the antisocial bull, or something of that nature. Okay, now the licensee is the person who has your approval to be on the premises. Not conferring a benefit on you, but he has your approval, by acquiescence or otherwise. Now the bare licensee is sort of grudgingly permitted to stay. The full licensee asked you for permission, and you gave it to him to be there. You're under a duty to tell the licensee of dangers you know about that he doesn't. And that's about as far as you need to go with the licensee. Now, it used to be that the hunter was my primary example in this area. However, Iowa, about three years ago, and they cleaned it up a bit this last year, provided a rather substantial amount of protection to landowners who permit others to use their property for recreational purposes. And we'll be discussing that in just a moment that tends to remove the great concern about injury to hunters. The third is the social guest. This is the person who comes, slips on the highly waxed floor, or on the throw rug on that highly waxed floor, or stumbles on an implement of play in the hallway or on a stair. Now, basically, they take the premises as they are. But there is a little greater duty to the social guest than there is to the, invite, to the licensee to, to maintain the premises and to warn them of dangers and so on. The social guest status is not quite as well defined as the licensee and the invitee. Now at the top of the heap is the invitee, except possibly for the child trespasser, and some believe that the child trespasser is owed almost as much of a duty of care as the invitee. Now the invitee is the person who's on the premises for mutual business advantage. It's a business matter now. This may be the person or firm delivering lumber or delivering feed, the veterinarian. It may involve the salesman, at least after you've agreed to talk to the salesman. Now, when the salesman comes door to door knocking, he may be no more than a bare licensee until you invite him in and ask him to sit down. Then once you do that, you do ask the salesman. There's an affirmative duty to make and keep the premises safe, to use at least reasonable care, to search out hidden defects, to search out those things that might cause injury. And if you fail to do that, you might be liable. You might be responsible. There was a case not too long ago involving a shopping center in one of our larger Iowa cities. It snowed one day. The the shopping center management had the snow sc scraped off the shopping center parking lot, but as the sun came out later in the day, the small patches of snow left on the blacktop melted. That night froze. The next morning comes now the plaintiff. Parks her car, alights, falls on her derriere, and is severely injured. The question is, was the shopping center management responsible? Well, it turned out that they were. This was not according an invitee that quantum of protection and care that they are entitled to have. 
the situation changes sharply once you start talking about mutual business advantage. Then it ups the standard of care a great deal. All right. Any questions you might raise here? Yes. You are probably invitees. You're here. You've conferred a benefit on somebody, not on me, but you've conferred a benefit on the university by paying your enrollment fee. And well, I've wondered about that myself. Yes, yes. Yesterday, uh, I was putting on a workshop in Muscatine. It was very slick down there. It was just icy as could be. And we all walked in over a very treacherous, icy walkway and stairway. And I was joshing them rather uh, unkindly about that because quite obviously people who come confer a benefit, who provide compensation, are invitees. It used to be that the state wasn't too worried about invitee status, nor was a county, nor a school district, nor a city, because of the ancient doctrine of sovereign immunity. The court system was set up at a time when the king reigned supreme. He set up the court. And so it was deemed to be intellectually inconsistent to hail the king into his own court. Well, that would just would be unheard of. He set up a court to help out everybody, and to hail him into his own court would be really unheard of. From that developed the notion you can't sue the state. You can't sue the government. And that continued and continues in some states. In 1965, Iowa removed the sovereign immunity doctrine as to state-level agency. 1967, they extended that to counties, municipalities, school districts. So now in Iowa, there isn't the sovereign immunity that once existed. And so liability insurance protection is of much greater interest to governing bodies of political subdivisions than was the case a few years back. Well, it, it depends on the facts, of course. There could possibly be that. And there are some cases now that are being heard. This week, you may have noticed the suit that was filed with respect to the injury suffered by the Marshalltown High School student, suit filed against the district as well as against the manufacturer of a lathe. The lathe apparently was turning at too rapid a rate of speed. The item being turned down exploded, and the individual was injured. $698,000 suit. So we're beginning to see more of these kinds of actions against public agencies, public bodies. Well, one would be not to see him. <laughs> the other is that if you see him, there really is no choice except to escort him by the nearest route out take reasonable means to have him removed. If you fail to do that, he becomes a bare licensee, a little higher on the totem pole, you see. Well, you can tell him to get out. That may be sufficient. And I suppose in 99% of the cases, it is. Then you count the 1% where it isn't. Now, there is an argument that if you've ordered him off and you are not tolerating his continued presence, that he may still continue to be a trespasser if you've made it very, very clear, you see. But at least if you acquiesce at all in his presence, then he has moved up a notch. Would a person, would a person who has slipped on the ice, where is there any responsibility for an individual who has some control of his own body? I mean, after all, the right to step on anybody's ice uh, may not be yours. You may be yep. dealing with the public where the you're the question is the reasonableness of the hazard. Now, we are talking not about a monolithic plaintiff. We're talking about old plaintiffs, young plaintiffs, middle-aged plaintiffs, watchful plaintiffs, non-watchful plaintiffs. And many of the people who are injured are older individuals whose perception may be good, but whose faculties may not be quite as sound, or when they fall, injury is greater, and so on. So that is what the courts are dealing with, you see. Where should the cost be, be borne? I mentioned early, here we're setting up a gross kind of a framework for deciding who's going to bear the cost. If someone's injured, who should bear the cost? 
And there's an argument that maybe the person who fell should bear the cost. Maybe the, the cost should be spread more widely. And what we're really saying is that it's probably spread more, more widely through the medium of insurance. This is a considered a cost of doing business, so to speak. Possibly so, possibly so. But the courts have been reluctant to, sell, to say the stores were open, there were implied invitations for you to come down and merchandise, you should have stayed at home. The courts are inclined to say if you're going to invite these people in, the duty is on you to provide a reasonably safe place for them to park, if you're going to provide a place to park, a reasonably safe place for them to walk, reasonably safe area for them to conduct their business. Failing that, may be liable. <laughs> yes, many times a sign like that, or one that says danger, bad dog or mad dog, that's probably a very dangerous thing to do because you've given up the major defense you have. You've told the whole world you knew it was a dangerous situation. And what could be worse, you see, than for the plaintiff to photograph that, move it into court and say, Your Honor, I will now offer an evidence Exhibit A. Well, now what is Exhibit A? Exhibit A is a sign erected by the defendant 30 days before or 10 days before or 10 minutes before the act. And then it's read, Danger, Slippery Steps. And then the question is, well, Instead of putting up the sign, why didn't you do something about the slippery step? You acknowledge you knew it was slippery. Otherwise, your major defense is, well, gee, I didn't realize that was a slippery step. It happened so quickly, I did not. But if you put up a sign, you've admitted it to the whole world. So you want to be careful about signs like that. Does the concept of invitee to your premises also carry forward with passenger in an automobile? All right. That's a special situation. And we're going to talk about that on page two. In fact, at this point, Let's cover negligence, bottom of page one, top page two, then we'll break, then we'll go into special situations, which include the passenger in the automobile. Was there one question back here? All right, it appears later in our discussion, but parents are liable for acts of their children up to $1,000 per event, $2,000 to the same person for two or more events. If the, children, if the children are under age 18 and they have legal custody over them, and if the children were committing an unlawful act. This was passed, say again? All right, the parents have been told that there is a hazardous situation. Well, then at least you have a de an additional defense. I'm not saying that's a complete defense, but at least you have acted uh, fairly reasonably in that respect by using what one means available to you. The other means, obviously, is to set up a, a mechanism to keep them off, like a snow fence, something of that nature. All right, now negligence, although it's not quite as glamorous, maybe, as some other aspects of tort liability. Nonetheless, the negligence area tends to be the most important one. This is where most of the liability questions are resolved. We're going to go through a mechanism, a framework for you to use in analyzing about any situation that might come up. For negligence to exist, four conditions must be present. We look upon these as four links in the chain. You are, in general, not a guarantor of anyone's safety. If someone's injured, the question is, were you negligent? What must exist for negligence to be fastened upon someone? Well, the first condition for negligence, the first link in the chain, so to speak, is whether the person acted as a reasonable and prudent man. Now, that's a hypothetical, mythical standard. It is, however, 
the standard against which a judge or jury will measure your conduct. Whatever you did or failed to do, does it meet or exceed the standard of care of the reasonable and prudent man? Society has decided this is what we consider to be the minimum performance of people. We expect everyone to live up to this. Whatever the reasonable and prudent man would have done under the circumstances that you are responsible for in terms of attaining that level. Now, if it is a regular, everyday individual, this is the standard, the reasonable and prudent man. If, however, it happens to be a professional individual or someone who holds himself out or herself out in business as having skill and expertise and knowledge beyond the, the, that of the reason prudent man, then you use an appropriate standard otherwise. For example, the physician is held to the standard of care of the reasonable and prudent physician practicing in the community. The veterinarian held to the standard of care of the reasonable and prudent veterinarian. The architect, the standard of care of the reasonable and prudent architect. The engineer, the standard of care of the reasonable and prudent engineer. The lawyer, the same way, and so on. Now, in professional circles, this is called malpractice. If you fail to meet the standard of care relevant to your particular group. Now there's concern I know among some university employees because now that we don't have sovereign immunity there's the potential problem always of, of an employee being involved too. But the best protection is always to conduct yourself in such a way that you have fully complied with the standard of care of the reasonable and prudent person in your situation. If so, you don't have much to worry about. All right. All right, we're going to cover, right after the coffee break, specifically manufacturer's liability and show where we are today, where we've been. The second link in the chain for negligence to obtain is there must be a causal relationship between the act done, complained of, or not done, and the damages suffered. Third requirement is there must be damages suffered. Here you can recover generally for actual damages. Then there must be a causal relationship between the act complained of and the damages. It cannot be a perfectly fortuitous kind of a result. If the person was negligent, but the loss was attributable to some other reason, then even though he failed to act as a reasonable prudent man, you can't hold him for negligence unless the negligent act, failure to act as a reasonable prudent man, is reasonably related on a foreseeability basis to the damages suffered. The fourth necessary condition is that there must be an absence of negligence on the part of the complaining individual. If whoever is doing the complaining himself or herself was negligent, that negligence which is contributory to the injury or damage may bar recovery. It's the idea of contributory negligence. The person doing the complaining might have been negligent himself. And that returns to the point made earlier. Maybe the person who was out on a very bad day walked across an icy stretch. Maybe that was contributory negligence. At least that can be argued. And then it's up to the court to determine whether the contributory negligence is proven, and if so, whether it should bar recovery. Because there is a duty on the part of the complaining individual himself to act as a reasonable and prudent man too. See. Well, this is the framework for determining liability in the majority of instances where liability is fastened. Now, there are some special situations, some special situations where the, the state has decided we don't want to live by the rules of negligence. We are going to modify the traditional rules of negligence in the greater interest of public policy. The negligence framework is a very useful one, a very utilitarian one. But there are some places where something else might fit better. The first of these is in the case of the non-paying guest in a motor vehicle. If a person is riding in a motor vehicle without paying or otherwise rendering a benefit, then the person can recover the guest 
crashed in the automobile mm -hmm. only if the driver of the automobile was either reckless or intoxicated. Simple negligence won't do it. Thus, it's extremely difficult in Iowa for a guest, a non-paying, non-benefit conferring guest to recover. It requires a rather great showing, much beyond simple negligence. Question. For quite some time in Iowa. Now, some states, and Minnesota is one of these, uh, follows a different rule. In Minnesota, uh, something approaching simple negligence is enough. And some have pointed out that the insurance rates in those states permitting an easy recovery or more easy recovery by a social guest, uh, the insurance rates, as you'd expect, would be somewhat higher. Well, yeah, but that was not your social guest who was injured. It wasn't your social guest who was suing you. It was somebody else. You had control over the social guest, possibly. You were responsible for the injuries resulting from the accident. But if the social guest had tried to sue you, then the social guest rule could have been invoked. Do you see that distinction? Uh, let's take the, if you pick up a hitchhiker, a rather traditional, straightforward hitchhiker, where you're simply rendering a gratuitous service and there's an accident, then it's very difficult for the hitchhiker to recover unless you are reckless or intoxicated. Now, in many cases, uh, there is a tremendous effort made to see if the social guest wasn't conferring some sort of a benefit, maybe a carpool arrangement, something of that nature, maybe a business trip. And, and the injured individual will try very hard to justify some status other than a social guest status. You have a regularized carpool where a benefit is being conferred. Well, you may very well be out of this kind of an arrangement. One of the most recent cases on this in Iowa involved a situation where a mother was taking her bluebirds to camp and an accident took place suit was brought and they went to the Iowa Supreme Court.